I didn't do it, but if I did do it, not that I did do it, I don't remember not doing it, so I didn't mean to say I didn't do it. Or if I did, I didn't knowingly do it, even if I did do it, which I didn't do it. Or it may have been the other way around, I can't recall, doesn't matter, and anyway, you lot are all bent as corkscrews wrapped in nine bob notes. Now that, as I understand it, is broadly speaking the essence of Boris Johnson's defence of the Commons Privileges Committee about the charge of knowingly deceiving Parliament about the lockdown parties. It sounds like Just William with his hands still wrapped around the catapult, or possibly Bertie Wooster after consuming an omelette of hallucinogenic mushrooms. At any rate, not entirely convincing, because the current leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has announced today five pledges or five mission statements for, for, for a future Labour government and they include the fastest growth in the G7, a growth pledge, making Britain a, a green energy superpower, no surprise there, uh, reforming our national health service so that it can survive and prosper in the future, making Britain's streets safe a crime pledge and breaking down barriers to opportunity in education and skills. Listening to that, is that enough? For a well, centre-left party, <clears throat> that's something that you know politicians all over the world will say. What, who is going to disagree with anything? The, the devil is always in the details. Uh, when you talk about uh, GDP growth, that's fine, but who benefits from that growth? Are we talking about that growth trickling down to the middle class and working class of the country, or are the rich going to get richer? That's really the issue. And if you're concerned about growing the working class of this country, seeing people do better economically. What are your specific policies uh, to do that? Mm. In the end, it, it's about ambition. As you say, it's about ambition on what you would call middle class, we call working class incomes. Um, how central do you think more power, more influence for the trade union movement is? Look, I'm a strong believer in the trade union movement. I've worked with the trade union movement my whole life. Uh, right now, we're taking on some large corporations who are engaged in terrible union busting efforts, illegal efforts. So I believe in democracy. And democracy means that working people have got to have power. And one way you have power is through a trade union. That is power on the job to negotiate a decent contract. That means political power as well when millions of workers mm. come together around an agenda that works for them. We're going through a period in this country <clears throat> where huge numbers of people are going on strike. Nurses, junior doctors, council workers, right across the board, ambulance workers again and again, waves and waves of strikes because, as you said, their incomes have fallen so much, partly because of inflation over the last 10 years. And yet, on the Labour side of the argument, there's a great reluctance of Labour politicians to stand beside them on picket lines and stand beside union members. From your perspective, would you urge people to do that? All I can tell you is I have been on picket lines for 50 years. Uh, the crisis in America right now is that working people are falling further and further behind, and the gap between the people on top and workers is growing Same here. wider. Same here. Uh, and I don't know how you have a political party that stands for anything if they don't stand with the working class of this country. And I suspect in the UK it's not radically different than it is in the United States. People on top are doing very, very well. Mm. And I think why so many people get demoralized and alienated from the political process is they see the people on top doing phenomenally well and they're saying, who is standing with me? Who is worried about the future of my kid? Mm. Whether I can afford to send my kid to college? Who is worried about whether I can pay the rent? And you need, in my view, political parties in the United States, in the UK, all over the world, who say, you know what, we're prepared to take on powerful special interests. We're going to stand with the working class, with the unions. Well, first of all, I really have no respect for Liz Trust. I thought her mini trust is the real blow to the British, British integrity and fiscal responsibility. So if anyone really gives heed to what Liz Trust says, he or she may fall victim to her disaster and catastrophe to the fundamental interests of the British people. Now, mm. uh, for any major country, including China and Britain, they practice espionage about each other or against each other. That's in the normal course of their business. But for anyone to really suspect that China, to the best of my knowledge, will have anything, any interest or any time and resources spent to uh, look into the proceedings in the UK Parliament, I think 
personally. Mm. That's a huge misjudgment because I truly believe, and I spend so much time watching the proceedings of the parliament in public TV, you can get most of it, if not all, in the public. Mm. And I watched the Liz Trust many times, spending many hours following her remarks leading to the disaster, which caused my complete loss in confidence about Liz Trust as a person, as a politician. Can I ask you a, a wider question, Mr. Gao, which is there's a lot of people in the UK who are concerned about China simply being too powerful in Britain. And in a sense, that's because we no longer make so many of the things that you make and you export to us, whether it's our phones or our televisions or parts of our telecommunication system or so much else, perhaps in due course our cars as well. Does the, the, in, the power of the Chinese economy inside Britain not also bring with it some kind of whip hand power over British politics eventually? Thank you very much for asking this very important question. There are several things allow me to emphasize. One is that it is a fact, it is a hard fact, that China is the largest trading partner with more than 130 nations in the world. It's not just with Britain, it's with 130 other nations, big or small, and you need to live with that fact. You cannot just fight against that megatrend in the world. Secondly, yes, China produces many things, exports many things, but about one third of the products out of China are made by American invested companies in China. Another one third about European companies or Japanese companies or South Korean companies or China's Taiwanese companies made these products in China and exported them abroad. Only about one third of the products roughly more or less are made by domestic Chinese companies. So mm. if you are worried about these exports from China to Britain, you're worried about one third produced by American companies, another mm. one third produced by other developed countries, etc. So yes, I don't yes. think you need to be agitated about that. It's Come. a real fact. Can I, can, can I end with a very straightforward question? There's a big debate in Britain about how what language we use about China. Are you a competitor? Are you an ally? Are you a, are you a threat? How would you regard your relationship with Britain? First of all, between China and Britain, from the Chinese perspective, Britain is not a rival, is not a competitor, it is not an enemy, is not an adversary. Britain is just an important country to get along with in peace and in friendship and for mutual benefit. Now, how Britain looks at China, it's up to the British government and people to decide. But I think it will be completely misguided for Britain to view China as an enemy or adversary or a competitor. What do China and Britain compare? compete with. China is the largest manufacturer of automobiles competing with Britain? No. China is the largest exporter of EV cars and will lead the whole world in EV production. Is Britain a competitor? No. China will be the biggest and most important producer and R&D in terms of semiconductor in no time. Does that mean that China competes with Britain? No. China will be the leading nation in AI revolution. Is Britain a competitor? No. So I think British government should not overestimate its impact on the global scene and view Britain as a rival of China. China is not. China is a fact. China is a megatrend for Britain to live with and get along with. Let's make peace rather than agitating for war. I think it could well be. I remember hearing um, a Tory sage, Bill Deeds, saying 40 years ago he thought Europe could break the Conservative Party, and that's the way to bet. But what seems to some of us important is that we want to be part of a Britain with a future. We do not want to be part of a Britain with a past. And all these right-wingers that The Economist wrote very vividly that Jacob Rees-Mogg belonged in a museum, not a cabinet. And... Um, that's how most of us feel. We feel, for God's sake, do we have to go on with all this nonsense about um, um, sovereignty and about um, all these issues from the past of Britain. And those people who voted today, the Ian Duncan Smiths, the Liz Trusses, these are all people of the past. We've got to move on. Now, if Rishi Sunak can do that, um, last night I was at Michael Heseltine's 90th birthday party, and of the 300 people who were there that... Almost everybody there 
wanted Rishi Sunak to succeed. Mm. But whatever your political convictions, this feeling that this is a good guy, this is somebody who's trying to do the right thing for Britain. So we want to support Rishi Sunak if we can. But if those lunatics on the right wing of the Conservative Party succeed in dragging down Rishi Sunak, then we can't be part of all this. And there was a Johnson there as well. And there was a Johnson there as well, Stanley Johnson. And um, um, the whole clan, um, the misery and the trouble they brought on Britain, I find it very hard to be civil to any member of that family because what grief they brought on our country. So that's something quite extreme to say about, about Boris Johnson. You know, there are plenty of people, even now, who say he was the great leader who won that huge victory in 2019. He was the leader who delivered Brexit. Now, we can have arguments about Brexit, but it seems to me that your problem with Johnson goes deeper than that. A few years ago, um, a very old friend of mine who's since accepted a peerage from Boris Johnson and with whom um, I haven't had any traffic ever since as a result. And she said to me about Boris, she said, get real, Max, we're in the post-truth age. And she was arguing that the fact that Boris Johnson is a serial liar doesn't matter. Now, some of us believe that it matters hugely. Some of us believe that today is a critical moment for Britain because we've got to try and get away from this. We've got to try and get back to um, a world and to a body politic um, in which um, whether you are a, um, tell the truth or you're a liar really matters. Now, I happen to believe that Rishi Sunak is a truth teller. And I think that's one of the reasons why I terribly want him to succeed and why, if I can, one will support him. We have to see off these serial liars that um, the essence of the whole Boris Johnson story, of the whole Boris Johnson narrative, um, is that Boris has said, yeah, I'm a liar, I'm a chancellor, I'm all the other things, but who cares? Mm. Some of us, the British people, care terribly. So what's going on in the House of Commons today, what's going on in front of the, the Privileges Committee, is not a small parliamentary story from your point of view. It really is about the soul, not just of the Conservative Party, but of parliamentary democracy. It's what sort of Britain um, we want to live in. And if we can't see off these terrible people... Um, then one does begin to feel certainly that one couldn't, couldn't vote Conservative again, um, but also one feels um, um, terrible things for the body politic of our country. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the tactics in the weeks ahead, days and weeks ahead. In terms of the Privileges Committee, if they uh, recommend that he's to be suspended from Parliament for 10 days or more, there could well be a by-election. There probably will be a by-election in Uxbridge, and it's hard to see him winning that. So that's the end of his political career. But if he manages to get through this committee, do you seriously think he will try to come back, that there will be a sort of prince across the water? I don't think you can write off Boris Johnson until he's buried at a crossroads with a stake driven through his heart. Um, but on the other hand, I think that he is a blight, um, not only on the Conservative Party, but on the British body politic. Um, that it's a question of whether the Conservative Party have the courage to move on, have the courage to say, um, this man has done terrible things to our country, he's done terrible things to our party, this must come to an end. Now, I'm not sure that they have the guts to do that, but this is what we're going to find out in the um, hours and days ahead. Uh, 22 people voted against the government tonight, but around 45, 46, 47, 48 abstained as well. I think 48 abstained. That's quite a large group of people. Does Rishi Sunak from now on therefore have to be incredibly careful about how he deals with post-Brexit, European issues in particular? Is he now somebody whose real majority is close to zero? I think Rishi Sunak has got to display the guts um, to show real leadership. And I think the British people want him to do that. But yes, you've got these lunatics out there who are trying to bring down Sunak, who are trying to bring back Johnson, who are obsessed with the European issue. But for some of us, the key test of Rishi Sunak is whether he has the nerve to call down these people, not to bow to them, not to negotiate with them, not to parley with them, but to say that the Jacob rees mogg School of Life, the Ian Duncan Smith School of Life, that these people, frankly, in the eyes of most of the people, they're nutters. That they don't realise we live next mm. door to Europe, mm. even if we're outside Europe. Um, we've got to work with Europe. 
This is what Sunak's trying to do. This is what they're trying to stop him doing. And I believe he's got to see them off. It's worth reflecting a little bit on Rishi Sunak himself because, um, you know, he can seem very overeager to please. And yet when it comes to these issues, he's been pretty steely. He was asked in America if he would help Boris Johnson if the Privileges Committee uh, laid down a harsh punishment. And he said no. He does seem to be somebody who's prepared, who is up for this fight. We have to hope for it. We have to hope that the Johnson era is going to come to be perceived in the years ahead um, as a sort of dreadful aberration, as something that the British people realised was a disaster and that the Conservative Party now has the courage to realise was a disaster and to consign, to send Boris Johnson back where he belongs um, to the music halls. He is a brilliant journalist, he's a brilliant entertainer. He had no place in British public life. Do you think this is an existential threat now for the Conservative Party? I think the Conservative Party are in a very dangerous place. Um, I don't think the Conservative Party has been written off many times, mm. and I don't believe this is going to be the end for the Conservative Party. But unless they can come to terms with this, unless they can um, behave like decent people and behave as I think most of the British people want them to behave, um, then I think the, they're, con they're heading for a period in the electoral wilderness, which it will take them many years to come back from. Now, I am not the most sporty guy in the newsroom, far from it. I can tell you about Gary Lineker. He used to play football for some team called England, and he did OK. Hat tricks, golden boots. Beyond that, he eats crisps. He likes crisps. He goes on the telly, on the BBC, and he talks about other people playing football. And he's pleased when they score goals. And he's sad but understanding when they don't. And he's smiling, he seems like a nice bloke. But he really doesn't like this Tory government, and he particularly doesn't like their immigration policy, which reminds him of Germans some time back, led by a little man with a moustache. He tweets about this. For the uninitiated, tweeting is something you do when you're sitting on the loo, and you're all finished, but you can't quite be bothered to get up yet. And this tweeting, well, it's very important. And Gary is going to carry on doing that. He is not saying sorry. But perhaps at this point, I should say sorry for being facetious about something which is just a little, just a little important. Lineker's attacked the Tories. They've hit back, attacking him for bad taste in his Nazi comparison and for showing inappropriate political bias for someone paid so much out of the licence fee. The Conservatives, despite having one of their own in place as BBC chairman, Richard Sharp, remain weirdly obsessive about the corporation. They blame it for everything, in much the same way that farmers look up and blame the weather. And in Gary Lineker, they have a new stick to beat the BBC with. But what complicates all of this is that the BBC seems so keen to be beaten. With a masochistic enthusiasm you rarely find outside dungeons where the men wear gimp masks, the corporation has been leading its bulletins not on migration policy or anything else in the real world, but on Gary Lineker. And this is utterly mad. It reminds me of one of those awful shaky videos you sometimes see of ill-treated pitch ponies being led out into the air, still compulsively twitching and flinching. What can the BBC do now? It's in a completely impossible position. Really, now that he's become such a useful weapon against the BBC, the BBC should part company with this sports presenter. But it can't just sack him for bias, because next everyone would turn to the small issue again of its own chairman being so closely connected to the Tory party in general and Boris Johnson in particular. I did mention at the time that I thought the Richard Sharp business was a problem. But the BBC can't effectively discipline Lineker either because he refuses to be effectively disciplined. I'm afraid, and I say this as a grateful former BBC employee who admires the corporation but left to get his own voice back, that the BBC is well and truly stuffed over this one. And when they say there's nothing you can say, say nothing. The best thing it can do now is to stop reporting its own misery with such bizarre enthusiasm. We're going to have to have a new agreement at some point with the EU on this, aren't we, to ensure that we're all 
applying the same kind of rules to people crossing Europe and then arriving up on the English coast. Yes, I mean, most of the people who arrive, obviously, particularly those coming in small boats, have mm. been through other European countries. Mm. And obviously, a number of uh, my colleagues will say, and this is, um, this is right, that somebody who is genuinely fleeing persecution would, would be claiming asylum mm. in the first safe country that they that they mm. get to. But we do need to be talking to our European allies about this issue, which potentially will be exacerbated mm. by climate change. We, we, you know, significant numbers are spoken of in future migration mm. and climate change could exacerbate that problem. Yes, and, and very may very well. Um, let me turn, if I may, to Brexit, which was the, the thing really at the heart of your prime ministership, those awful, awful weeks when you were trying to get uh, a, a gentler deal, if I can put it that way, through the House of Commons. And by your account in this book, there was almost a kind of conspiracy by hardcore Remainers who just didn't want anything to do with Brexit at all, led by the then Speaker of the House, John Burko, on the one side, and hardcore Brexiters who wanted the hardest possible Brexit. And together, they scuppered your deal, which you think would have made this country more prosperous and happier afterwards had it gone through. Well, I was very clear when I uh, became Prime Minister that I needed to deliver Brexit because the majority had voted for that. It was a democratic will of the people. But it was a close vote. Mm. And therefore, I always thought we should do it in a way that recognised the concerns that the 48% remainers... A sort of softer shown. Brexit, a, a, as a softer in the, the word. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and, yes, I mean, I used to get slightly frustrated at the terms hard and soft Brexit, mm. um, but very much that, that a deal that I thought could uh, try to maintain as much of the advantages that we'd had of, of the freer trade, for example, with the European Union uh, in the past as members, but try to maintain a, a good trade, that good trading relationship for the future. Um, unfortunately, the deal I presented to Parliament was not accepted. And what happened over time was, you're right, the hardline Brexiteers wanted something hard, much harder, um, and the hardline Remainers saw an opportunity um, perhaps to try for a second referendum and That's overturn really the whole yes. thing. Yes. yes. You don't let rip very much in this book, but you let rip at John Burko. Uh, you call him a liar and a bully, and you accuse him really of twisting parliamentary rules to suit his own political agenda. Explain. Yes, well, those are two different things, in a sense, because the, the term of being a, a, a bully and a liar actually was the term used by a report, uh, in a report on him mm. in terms of his behaviour towards his staff. Uh, and that was part of... I, mean, I talk about other behaviour of MPs or behaviour mm. of other MPs towards their staff and the issues that have arisen, but that was a very specific issue around John Burke's behaviour to his staff. When it came to Brexit... I did feel the way he used um, parliamentary um, rules and, and uh, procedures um, was, in, on a number of occasions, to advantage of those who wanted a second referendum. And there was a point at which uh, we were close to getting um, our confidence and supply partners, the Democratic Unionist Party, to accepting the deal. And that was critical for a lot of my Conservative colleagues, so it could have got the whole thing mm -hmm. over the line. And uh, the Speaker declared that we couldn't put the motion to the House. And because and we of lost that, that, it support. slipped away at the last moment. Yes. So that's a little bit about the Remain side of the argument. On the Leave side of the argument, you say that Jacob Rees-Mogg um, took a sledgehammer to the Constitution in two suggestions he made to you during that period. What were they? Well, the first was that uh, what was happening was that the... Uh, Remainers were trying to get legislation through Parliament to ensure we couldn't leave the EU without a deal, that there was no, no deal. Um, and his suggestions were, in order to stop that, I, I prorogue Parliament. Um, of course, Boris Johnson later prorogued Parliament did, yeah. and found the Supreme Court found that to be unlawful. Uh, or that if the Act was passed, I suggested to the Queen that she didn't sign it and give it royal assent. I rejected both of those. Um, <laughs> And I thought there was a, a general sense, and I think it's still in Parliament today with the use of the humble, it's called a humble address, which brings the monarch into uh, a, a, a more of a role in Parliament than there should be in our constitutional monarchy. Boris Johnson eventually did a deal which resulted in the sea border between uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, something you fought very, very hard to avoid. Do you think candidly that he was putting his own personal position ahead of the national interest when he did that? I think Boris wanted to get a deal. Um, I had always said that the deal that he accepted with that border down the Irish Sea uh, could not be accepted by, in my view, by any UK Prime Minister. 
um, because of the separation between Great Britain and Northern Ireland that it created. Um, but he accepted what the EU had actually proposed in the first place and then claimed it was a great victory. Was uh, he... And on the back of that, of course, he was able to say he'd done Brexit and he, he mm. uh, on the back of aiming to get Brexit, he was able to get the very good election result he got in 2019. Was he straight with us? I think you, you have to ask Boris what he thought at the time mm. of that. I mean, I think the question is, was he... Did he recognise the impact this would have on Northern Ireland or was he just so keen to get a deal and to be able to claim victory? He and just it, accepted it. And it was, in your view, not a good deal in the end. It was a bad deal. It was a bad deal, I think, as we saw from all the problems we had on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mm. And Rishi Sunak came in and, of course, agreed the Windsor Framework, which has eased that situation and, uh, and um, you know, in many ways resolved those issues. Uh, but we had that period of time when it was really very difficult for Northern mm. Ireland and difficult for people, you know, safer markets and so forth in the in Great Britain who were sending food over to Northern Ireland, all the the, the checks and stuff that, that uh, came as a result of Boris's deal. So that's why, you know, I think my deal would not have been in that position and would have been better. Politicians always say that the police have operational independence, but Rishi Sunak today warned that Sir Mark would be held accountable for allowing the march to go ahead, and after his meeting with him he said that there remained the risk of those who sought to divide society using this weekend as a platform to do so. The government, he said, would do everything in its power to protect this special weekend. So, who is really in charge of order on our streets? Police? or Prime Minister. This is a genuinely delicate matter. Saturday's proposed march goes nowhere near White or, or the Cenotaph and would start well after the time of commemoration. But is it possible that breakaway troublemakers from hardline leftists and Islamists to Just Stop Oil and not forgetting far-right groups organised around football clubs try to exploit this moment to make their points in front of television cameras? Of course it is. Will the police be very stretched? Yes, they will. Some are already predicting a riot in central London. But should we easily give up the notion that in a free country we have the freedom to protest? No, we should not. Here, for anyone who missed it, is what Winston Churchill's grandson, Lord Soames, told me about this dilemma just yesterday. I think that a lot of people died during the war to assert right. freedom. I think it must be allowed to go ahead. It's nowhere near the cenotaph. It's 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 in the afternoon. It's our thing, and most of those people, ninety percent of those people, are not there to make trouble. They're there to express a deeply held view. Now there may well be trouble ahead. Lots could go wrong. If the marches and counter-marches go ahead and there is really serious trouble in London, the Met Commissioner is going to have to explain himself not just to the Prime Minister, but to the country. But if the Home Secretary gets her way and bans the march and that sparks a serious confrontation between protesters and police, she is in the frame herself. That was, of course, a difficult year. But I also understand that uh, we are moving in the right direction. And uh, it, was, it has been sent yesterday by uh, President Putin uh, in his address. So uh, the situation is in Ukraine. Ukraine itself is in an extremely difficult position right now. It is becoming uh, fable and fable. And this is uh, mostly due to the Western assistance. It is only half of population is living right now in Ukraine. Its uh, gross domestic products is 35% down. It lost its industry and agriculture. It is losing its uh, human resources because it's already the seventh wave of uh, inscription uh, calling up and it is uh, less and less trained people are now uh, fighting in the eastern front as for our side it is we are steadily uh, gaining terrain and moving and acquiring more and more terrain and we continue to do that you mentioned just now uh, president putin's address yesterday in that address he said that um, on a trust and decency were not things that the rest, the West recognised. Uh, what is honourable, what is decent about destroying the infrastructure, uh, the electricity 
of a country which is now 30 degrees below in the middle of winter and where people are really in deep, deep distress. What's honourable about that? It is, uh, we are destroying command controls and communication system of uh, the armed forces. But also well, the electricity not, system. Not the uh, command control and communication system of armed forces, just to prevent movement on it. As for decency, he was speaking about different things. He was speaking about uh, the acknowledgement that we have heard recently uh, that uh, eight years uh, of uh, negotiations about Minsk agreements, Minsk agreements is in fact, it's a peace plan, it's mm -hmm. a real peace plan. It was all uh, uh, imitation of diplomacy, like Boris Johnson has said, uh, it has been done for reinforcing, uh, they have need eight years to reinforce uh, Ukrainian forces, it has Merkel has said, and uh, François Hollande as well. So this is a kind of decency. It was deception uh, was, in fact, deception. Uh, uh, reality is uh, we really did believe that Minsk agreements could be implemented and it was it could bring peace to Donbass. It didn't happen. I want to come to how peace could one day be achieved a little bit later. But before we do that, I just want to stay with the war. According to the United Nations itself, around 8,000 civilians have been killed, including 450 children. And I just wonder how you feel about that. Badly, but I can tell you that also in accordance with United Nations calculation, uh, after 2014 and uh, this coup d'etat in Kiev, uh, 12,000 civilians has been killed, while uh, Ukrainian forces standing just in front of Donbass were shelling every day Donetsk, Lugansk and uh, towns and villages over there. Your president has described the regime in Kiev as a neo-Nazi or a Nazi government. Can you explain to people listening how it's possible for a Nazi government to be run by a Jewish president? No, uh, that's a question, a very hypothetical question. Uh, we are uh, speaking that it's ideologically wrong, absolutely, to oppress uh, one of the nations. Just imagine, for instance, that Belgium will prohibit French language. What President Hollande, uh, what President Macron is going to do? Safely just go for elections and <laughs> just neglect what is going to happen. The uh, uh, Kiev uh, uh, regime at the moment, he is prohibiting Russian language, Russian people. He is saying that all Russians get out of the country, uh, uh, prohibiting education, other things, discrimination, selling. So, well, this is what is bad. This is why we are calling this uh, such an approach, it's a Nazi approach. But your government says again and again that you are not are going to war against the Ukrainian people. Exactly. Um, and yet 8,000 uh, Ukrainians killed, uh, 13,000 badly injured. And this is happening because of the, the blast effect of Russian shells and Russian missiles hitting buildings, hitting nurseries, hitting hospitals. This is not an ordinary uh, military operation. This is a war of conquest. No, no Mr. Mar, uh, this is not a war of conquest. Uh, it is a war of, uh, uh, actually, uh, it's not a war, first of all, this is a special operation uh, in which we are trying to defend Russians and Russian speaking, as I have said already. You are bringing me ciphers, but what to do with the ciphers that has about killing uh, that has achieved before in Donbass, because we, every uh, such uh, terroristic attack, every criminal uh, did, uh, and I will say that last Sunday, uh, shelling was continued of mm. uh, Donetsk Republic and 12 people were killed, if I'm not mistaken, 12 or something. And the shelling, exactly, uh, buildings of the people, uh, the uh, electricity infrastructure and all of that. Let us stop this and we will think about this further. Um, we talked about the, the president's speech yesterday and I suppose the, the big surprise in it, or the big announcement at the end of it, was that Russia was withdrawing from the so-called Fresh Start uh, missile agreement with the United States. Um, but we've seen something on the uh, Foreign Ministry Telegram channel saying that this can be reversed. So can you uh, clear up whether or not Russia is withdrawing from that treaty, and if so, why? Uh, withdrawing is a wrong word. Uh, the not. right uh, term is suspension. Suspension means, uh, uh, first of all, the origin, why it has happened. Uh, the, uh, oh, what we are seeing right now is that uh, uh, United States, as a part of the treaty, is becoming more and more adversarial. Uh, its policy line is a strategic defeat on Russia. Strategic defeat, you can imagine that. 
uh, and also it has been joined by France and Britain uh, uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in this line. They also would like to, to put strategic defeat uh, in Russia. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, UK is increasing its uh, nuclear arsenal by 40%, uh, as we understand, the uh, number of the warheads on, uh, on the nukes in the submarines. All of that. We have very few compared to you. Very oh, few. Oh, come on. Uh, they are saying that China also has a, a similar number, but the US is doing an effort to bring it into the negotiations. So all in all, it makes a uh, fundamental change of circumstances which lawyers are calling as a, uh, as a <coughs> precondition uh, to change the situation. Just, just let but, me explain but, to you. Okay, but let me explain to you. Uh, what we are doing right now, we are suspending our participation in this treaty, which basically means that we are suspending verification procedures. Mm. Yes. Exchange of info some exchange of information. Yes. Uh, 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 however, uh, we are responsible participants and uh, the limits uh, on the nuclear warhead will remain. We will stick to the limits that has been inscribed in the treaty. We also will continue uh, the uh, exchange about uh, launches of uh, missiles. So the main part of the body of the treaty uh, will remain. And this is reversible. If we will it is change. reversible. A this suspension is. could be reversed. Yes. Under what circumstances could it be reversed? The, uh, that the, uh, uh, we shall better conditions. We will, we, will, we will need to see that the US is reversing its, its policy of uh, creating anti-Russia anti out of Ukraine, mm -hmm. that it is coming back into the normal strategic situation. One of the fundamentals, by the way, it is um, the uh, link between offensive and defensive weapon. It is absolutely important. It has been from the very beginning of the strategic process. But the U.S. has uh, gone out of uh, uh, ABN Treaty, uh, which is, of course, one of the major preconditions of the stability here. Is this the beginning of a wider world war between Russia and the West? I hope, and I do not know, not at all, not this one step, but, however, uh, NATO countries are going deeper and deeper into the conflict, especially UK as a leading uh, European country uh, in this aspect by providing a more fighter and jets more now, possibly. Hmm? There's a cause to provide fighter jets uh, as well as m new battle tanks. Not sure, but the uh, long-range weapon is uh, the most dangerous here. The longer uh, range of this weapon will be, the further we will have to uh, push this line uh, in Ukraine, because we we have we need to safeguard Crimea and the main part of Russia. So if UK is provided longer range weapons, so we will need them to push this line further uh, into Ukraine, just to secure ourselves. So further longer range missiles from the West yeah. means a push of the front line further exactly. west into Ukraine. Exactly. Oh, my friends, what a day it's been. Boris Johnson has this afternoon formally resigned from the Commons. He and Rishi Sunak are now at open war after the Prime Minister this morning accused him of trying to make him do improper things in his appointment of his cronies to the Lords. Boris Johnson asked me to do something that I wasn't prepared to do because I didn't think it was right. Uh, that was to uh, you know, either overrule the HOLAC committee or to make promises to people. Now, I, I wasn't prepared to do that. As I said, I didn't think it was right. And if people don't like that, then tough. And in response to that, Boris Johnson said, quotes, Rishi Sunak is talking rubbish. Boys, boys. In other news, a week after Mr Sunak claimed victory over Stop the Boats, on Sunday, record numbers of people crossed the channel, more than 600 in a single day. In Scotland, absolute meltdown as Nicola Sturgeon was arrested and then released without charge. Meanwhile, Silvio Berlusconi, the modern inventor in Italy of big dog, big daddy, macho populism has died. Without Silvio, I think, no Trump and perhaps no Brexit era Johnson either. So much to talk about, but yet again, it is the single figure of Boris Johnson, the albino gorilla himself, who has been overshadowing the entire news agenda all day. And I have to tell you, I'm so bored of Boris Johnson, I could scream. It's hot. I'm like a boiling kettle ejecting steam. I am just so bored of Boris Johnson and his life. I know more about him than I do about my wife. 
the glory years of japes and pranks at Eton, the never giving up or knowing when he's beaten, the web of Oxford chums, Dave and George and Gove, the trysts with trusting girls in flats, hotels and groves, the lies he told to them, and then the lying to the Times long before the fatal porkies over party lockdown crimes, the shrugging off of misbehaviour with a laugh, the cripes, I'll make it up, reporting for the Telegraph, and words like cripes and chums and japes and pranks and yikes and bozza. Enough, no more, no thanks, or that gobbling up of airtime and paper by the ream, as if we've all been jailed inside one man's mad dream. Oh, I'm so bored of Boris Johnson, I could scream. I'm so bored of Boris Johnson, I could spew even the successes, for yes, there were of those a few. Genial, liberal Boris in the years of London City Hall, election winner against Ken and Corbyn, never short of gall, very fast to take the credit, e.g. Boris Bikes, e.g. Crossrail. He always wanted monuments, they wanted that to fail. He sliced through state bureaucracy, that was Byzantine. At least I suppose they've called it the Elizabeth and not the Johnson line. Then his return to Parliament prepared to oil and suck up to Tory leaders. I'm so bored of Johnson I could chuck. He always wanted to be lovable, like Paddington or Gromit, a cuddly national symbol. I'm so bored that I could vomit. He picks a thing up, caresses it, then wrecks it. And by thing, I'm thinking, obviously, of Britain and of Brexit, of whoppers, fibs and fraudulence and guile, and for his enemies, threats and menaces and bile. At birth, the angels gave him the gift of tongues, a glittering tree on which all life's prizes hung. They gave him great intelligence and sex appeal, strength of a grigly, grizzly bear, eyes of a baby seal. But then they said, we've given too lavish a gift list to baby Boris, so you will be as well a selfish narcissist and everything will turn to dust. Bad, then badder, will be your choices. The high call of politics, a ladder, no more than that, to clamber up. So nothing mattered, not voters conned, nor a once great party shattered. He wanted greatness. But yes, it's vanished like a dream. And sometimes, I'm so bored of Boris Johnson, I could scream. <laughs>